Mr. McCoy back with part 16 of the Phantom Tollbooth. As you recall, the math magician inquired, has Azaz agreed to it? Yes, sir, the dog assured him. Then I don't, he thundered, for since they've been banished, we've never agreed on anything, and we never will. He emphasized his last remark with a dark and ominous look. Never? asked Milo with the slightest touch of disbelief in his voice. Never, he repeated, and if you can prove otherwise, you have my permission to go. Well, said Milo, who had thought about this problem very carefully ever since leaving Digitopolis. Then with whatever Azaz agrees, you disagree. Correct, said the mathematician with a tolerant smile. And with whatever Azaz disagrees, you agree. Also correct, yawned the mathematician, nonchalantly cleaning his fingernails with the point of his staff. Then each of you agrees that he will disagree with whatever each of you agrees with, said Milo triumphantly. And if you both disagree with the same thing, then aren't you really in agreement? I've been tricked! cried the mathematician helplessly, for no matter how he figured, it still came out just that way. Splendid effort, commented the humbug jovially. Exactly the way I would have done it myself. And now, may we go, added Tuck. The mathematician accepted his defeat with grace, nodded weakly, and then drew the three travelers to his side. It's a long and dangerous journey, he began softly, and a furrow of concern creased his forehead. Long before you find them, the demons will know you're there. Watch for them well, he emphasized, for when they appear, it might be too late. The humbug shuddered down to his shoes, and Milo felt the tips of his fingers suddenly grow cold. But there is one problem even more serious than that, he whispered ominously. What is it? gasped Milo, who was not sure he really wanted to know. I'm afraid I can tell you only when you return. Come along, said the mathematician, and I'll show you the way. And simply by carrying the three, he transported them all to the very edge of Digitopolis. Behind them lay all the kingdoms of wisdom, and up ahead a narrow, rutted path led toward the mountains and darkness. We'll never get the car on that, said Milo unhappily. True enough, replied the mathematician, but you can be in ignorance quick enough without riding all the way, and if you're to be successful, it will have to be step by step. But I would like to take my gifts, Milo insisted. So you shall, announced the dodecahedron, who appeared from nowhere with his arms full. Here are your sights, here are your sounds, and here, he said, handing Milo the last of them disdainfully, are your words. And most important of all, added the mathematician, here is your own magic staff. Use it well and there is nothing it cannot do for you. He placed in Milo's pocket a small gleaming pencil, which, except for the size, was much like his own. Then, with a last word of encouragement, he and the dodecahedron, who was simultaneously sobbing, frowning, pining, and sighing from four of his saddest faces, made their farewells and watched as the three tiny figures disappeared into the forbidding mountains of ignorance. So what do you suppose is going to happen now? Share that with your fellow listener. Almost immediately the light began to fade as the difficult path wandered aimlessly upward, inching forward almost as reluctantly as the trembling humbug. Talk, as usual, led the way, sniffing ahead for danger, and Milo, his bag of precious possessions slung over one shoulder, followed silently and resolutely behind. 
Perhaps someone should stay back to guard the way, said the unhappy bug, offering his services. But since his suggestion was met with silence, he followed gloomily along. The higher they went, the darker it became, though it wasn't the darkness of night, but rather more like a mixture of lurking shadows and evil intentions which oozed from the slimy moss-covered cliffs and blotted out the light. Cruel wind shrieked through the rocks and the air was thick and heavy as if it had been used several times before. On they went, higher and higher up the dizzying trail. On one side, the sheer stone walls and brutal peaks towering above them, and on the other, an endless, limitless, bottomless nothing. I can hardly see a thing, said Milo, taking hold of Toc's tail as a sticky mist engulfed the moon. Perhaps we should wait until morning. There'll be morning for you soon enough came a reply from directly above, and this was followed by a hideous, cackling laugh, very much like someone choking on a fishbone. Clinging to one of the greasy rocks and blending almost perfectly with it was a large, unkempt, and exceedingly soiled bird who looked more like a dirty floor mop than anything else. He had a sharp, dangerous beak, and the one eye he chose to open stared down maliciously. I don't think you understand, said Milo timidly as the watchdog growled a warning. We're looking for a place to spend the night. It's not yours to spend, the bird shrieked again and followed it with the same horrible laugh. That doesn't make any sense, you see, he started to explain. Dollars or cents, it's still not yours to spend, the bird replied haughtily. But I didn't mean, insisted Milo. Of course you're mean, interrupted the bird, closing the eye that had been open and opening the one that had been closed. Anyone who'd spend a night that doesn't belong to him is very mean. Well, I thought that by, he tried again desperately. That's a different story, interjected the bird a bit more amiably. If you want to buy, I'm sure I can arrange to sell, but with what you're doing, you'll probably end up in a cell anyway. That doesn't seem right, said Milo helplessly, for with the bird taking everything the wrong way, he hardly knew what he was saying. Agreed, said the bird with a sharp click of its beak, but neither is it left, although if I were you, I would have left a long time ago. Let me try once more, Milo said in an effort to explain. In other words... You mean you have other words? cried the bird happily. Well, by all means, use them. You're certainly not doing very well with the ones you know, and you have now. Must you always interrupt like that? said Tuck irritably, for even he was becoming impatient. Naturally, the bird cackled. It's my job. I take the words right out of your mouth. Haven't we met before? I'm the ever-present word snatcher, and I'm sure I know your friend the bug. And then he leaned all the way forward and gave a terrible, knowing smile. The humbug, who was too big to hide and too frightened to move, denied everything. Is everyone who lives in ignorance like you? asked Milo. Much worse, he said longingly. But I don't live here. I'm from a place very far away called Context. Don't you think you should be getting back? suggested the bug, holding one arm up in front of him. What a horrible thought, the bird shuddered. It's such an unpleasant place that I spend almost all my time out of it. Besides, what could be nicer than these grimy mountains? Almost anything, thought Milo as he pulled his collar up, and then he asked the bird, Are you a demon? I'm afraid not. He replied sadly as several filthy tears rolled down his beak. I've tried, but the best I can manage to be is a nuisance. And before Milo could reply, he flapped his dingy wings and flew off in a cascade of dust and dirt and fuzz. Wait! shouted Milo, who thought of many more questions he wanted to ask. 
34 pounds, shrieked the bird as he disappeared into the fog. He was certainly no help, said Milo, after they had been walking again for some time. That's why I drove him off, cried the humbug, fiercely brandishing his cane. Now let's find the demons. That might be sooner than you think, remarked Top, looking back at the suddenly trembling bug, and the trail turned again and continued to climb. In a few minutes they'd reached the crest, only to find that beyond it lay another one even higher, and beyond that several more, whose tops were lost in the swirling darkness. For a short stretch the path became broad and flat, and just ahead, leaning comfortably against a dead tree, stood a very elegant-looking gentleman. He was beautifully dressed in a dark suit with a well-pressed shirt and tie. His shoes were polished, his nails were clean, his hat was well brushed, and a white handkerchief adorned his top pocket. But his expression was somewhat blank. In fact, it was completely blank, for he had neither eyes, nose, nor mouth. Hello, little boy, he said, amiably shaking Milo by the hand. And how's the faithful dog? he inquired, giving Top three or four strong and friendly pats. And who is this handsome creature? he asked, tipping his hat to the very pleased humbug. I'm so happy to see you all. What a pleasant surprise to meet someone so nice, they all thought, and especially here. So do you suppose this gentleman is really as nice as he seems? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. I wonder if you could spare me a little of your time, he inquired politely, and help with a few small jobs. Why, of course, said the humbug cheerfully. Gladly, added Tot. Yes, indeed, said Milo, who wondered for just a moment how it was possible for someone so agreeable to have a face with no features at all. Splendid, he said happily, for there are just three tasks. Firstly, I would like to move this pile from here to there, he explained, pointing to an enormous mound of fine sand, but I'm afraid that all I have here are these tiny tweezers, and he gave them to Milo, who immediately began transporting one grain at a time. Secondly, I would like to empty this well and fill the other, but I have no bucket, so you'll have to use this eyedropper, and he handed it to Top, who undertook at once to carry one drop at a time from well to well. And lastly, I must have a hole through this cliff, and here is a needle to dig it. The eager humbug quickly set to work picking at the solid granite wall. When they had all been safely started, the very pleasant man returned to the tree and leaning against it once more, continued to stare vacantly down the trail while Milo, Tock, and the Humbug worked hour after 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 hour. Humbug whistled at his work for he was never as happy as when he had a job which required no thinking at all. After what seemed like days, he had dug a hole scarcely large enough for his thumb. Tuck shuffled steadily back and forth with the dropper in his teeth, but the full well was still almost as full as when he began, and Milo's new pile of sand was hardly a pile at all. How very strange, said Milo without stopping for a moment. I've been working steadily all this time, and I don't feel the slightest bit tired or hungry. I could go right on the same way forever. Perhaps you will, the man agreed with a yawn. At least it sounded like a yawn. Well, I wish I knew how long it was going to take, Milo said as the dog went by again. Why not use your magic staff and find out, replied Tok as clearly as anyone could with an eyedropper in his mouth. Milo took the shiny pencil from his pocket and quickly calculated at the, the rate they were working it would take each of them 837 years to be finished. Pardon me, he said, tugging at the man's sleeve and holding the sheet of figures up for him to see. 
but it's going to take 837 years to do these jobs. Is that so? replied the man without even turning around. Well, you'd better get on with it then. What do you think Milo, Tuck, and the Humbug are going to do now? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. And now literally seconds more of the Phantom Toll Booth. But it hardly seems worthwhile, said Milo softly. Worthwhile, the man roared indignantly. All I meant was that perhaps it isn't too important, Milo repeated, trying not to be impolite. Of course it's not important, he snarled angrily. I wouldn't have asked you to do it if I thought it was important. And now as he turned to face them, he didn't seem quite so unpleasant. Then why bother? asked Tok, whose alarm suddenly began to ring. We'll find out the answer to that question and so much more as the Phantom Tollbooth continues. <laughs>